Welcome to the speaker series for the Snohomish County Transportation Coalition. I'm Brock Howell, Executive Director of SnowTrack. Today, SnowTrack is excited to host Jarrett Walker. We thank Transportation Choices Coalition for serving as a co-host for today's forum and APA Puget Sound for providing continuing education credits for AICP licensed planners for attending as well. As a mobility management coalition, SnowTrack advocates for connecting people and communities in Snohomish County and beyond with safe, equitable, and accessible transportation. By bringing together transportation and human service providers to identify mobility gaps and opportunities. SnowTrack focuses especially on the needs of people with disabilities, older adults, youth, and low-income individuals, as well as people of color, immigrants and refugees, veterans, rural communities, and tribal nations. We are excited to have Jarrett Walker here today. Um, it is Ride Transit Month uh, here in the state of Washington uh, by official proclamation of Governor Inslee. And so I believe this is one of the first events uh, of, the, of the month and we're excited to, to host Jarrett. With our speaker series, we hope to inspire leaders and advocates with best practices from around the country and world. And so I cannot be more pleased to have Jarrett Walker here with us today. We'll have a Q&A at the end, so be sure to think of your questions throughout the presentation and feel free to add them into the Q&A box as we go. As president of the consulting firm, Jarrett Walker and Associates based in Portland, Oregon, Mr. Walker is an international consultant in public transit network design and policy. He is an author of Human Transit, How Clear Thinking About Public Transit Can Enrich Our Communities and Our Lives, published by Island Press in 2011, and I believe based off of tweets, there's an upcoming update to the book as well. So we're excited about that. Uh, with us today uh, in the audience, and I apologize, we're in webinar format, so you can't all see each other right now. Although when we get to Q&A, uh, we can certainly uh, invite people to we'll have a little bit more of a face-to-face -face interaction at that point. Uh, we have planners uh, and engineers from uh, departments of transportation, transit agencies, consulting firms, uh, as well as elected officials from Snohomish County, uh, across the state, and even the country. So it is great to have all of you here today, uh, and I hope for a lively discussion at the, at the end. And I believe Mr. Walker's presentation is about half an hour, so uh, questions are encouraged. Thank you again um, for all being here. Uh, and Jared, it's great to have you. Feel free to take it away and to load up your presentation. Thank you very much, Brock. Can you all hear me clearly? Can you see the screen? Can you see my We're good to go. Okay, great. Thank you very much, Brock. I really appreciate the invitation. I admire very much what SnowTrack and organizations like yours do to bring the whole community into transportation and make sure that everyone sees how to get their needs met. I won't spend too much on introducing myself since uh, Brock just did it. But I think the key point is that I've been designing, uh, I've been working on the design and redesign of public transit networks, mostly fixed route bus networks, um, all over the world for a long time, about 30 years. And um, that was the basis of this book. And my book is really an attempt to make the basic concepts of public transit clear and accessible in uh, to just about anyone to help people think about the choices that the facts about how public transit works, how it interacts geographically with the structure of a community, and how and, and what choices that requires us to think about. Um, our little company, um, we have 15 people um, working across uh, North America and Europe on transit network planning. And one of the things about, about us is that we like to say we foster clear conversations about transit leading to confident decisions. In other words, I believe very strongly that it's my job as a consultant to separate out my knowledge from my values and to offer up my knowledge in a form that lets you as a community implement your values rather than my values. 
And that's a really important, um, uh, really important fundamental. And so when we're doing transit planning, transit planning is always a big conversation about lots of people, but we really are focused on the quality and clarity of that conversation. By clarity, do I mean, do people understand the consequences of what they're advocating? Do we see that, do people, do ultimately the decision makers understand the consequences of the vote they're going to take? Which is why we say leading to confident decisions. <clears throat> Now, um, there's a lot of there are a lot of different theories out there about what public transit should be trying to do, and what we what transit agencies should be responding to. And one way to sort it is like this: there is there's a whole bunch of information that transit agencies and transit planners get all the time about what people say they want: survey results, public comments, political input, but that's very anecdotal, of course, and also it presents us with the problem that we are inevitably hearing from people who know how to communicate with us effectively. So the process of self-selected public input always presents basic equity questions uh, in terms of are we hearing from a sufficiently diverse, uh, diverse group of people. One interesting challenge that I think has improved just in the last couple of years as we've gone to more and more virtual meetings, is that in the old days before COVID, overwhelming um, percentage, and especially before we had universal web literacy, mo an overwhelming uh, share of public comments came in the form of public meetings. And public meetings require a lot of effort to attend. And because public meetings require a lot of effort to attend, people tend to attend them only if they have time. And as a result, we've tended to get a, 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 a public conversation that is a little bit biased against people who are too busy to go to a meeting. And that's one of the reasons why sometimes it's taken a while for the message to get through that actually it is really important that public transit be reasonably fast, that people that public transit needs to be available for people who are in a hurry, because people who are in a hurry don't come to public meetings. So because of all that, the next sort of, we, we tend to then go to data about what people are doing now. Um, we used to talk about ridership data, traffic data, reveal preference data. Now, of course, we have and are increasingly expected to use a, status, uh, a um, data source called um, LBS, location-based services data, which basically means data that has been scooped up from your cell phone showing in an anonymized way where you went during the day and where everyone went during the day and what kinds of flows of demand that created. That's what people are doing now. But what people are doing now is not necessarily what they want to do. The trips that people are making are sometimes a result of the trips they can make and people are not making trips that they can't make easily. So the danger about relying on data about what people are doing now is that it reinforces certain kinds of inequities of the existing system. We are only seeing the trips that we have already made possible because of the system that we have. That's not going to really break you out of the existing paradigm and help you see things in a new way. So the third way to think about this is to ask not what people are doing, but what people could do. What could people do? What are the options that people have presented to them by the transportation system? And that's what's formally called access or accessibility, but I want to, but I'm going to going to talk about it in terms of freedom as well, because I think freedom is a good word for it. I'm going to argue that when we talk about transportation and when, and when we talk about development, we need to talk about freedom. So, to get to to get this image, I want you to visualize the idea of a wall around your life, a wall that is defined by how, where you can get to in a reasonable amount of time and effort. So here's a person. She's in a city or a, or a region full of possible destinations around her, places she could shop, places she could worship, places she could study, places she could work, all kinds of things she could do that require a certain amount of travel. In 45 minutes, say, just to pick a, pick a number, she can get to us anywhere in a certain area. This is a blob that we can calculate based on where she is and what the transport network looks like from there. Well, her access 
is the number of jobs in that area. You can also have access to jobs as the number of jobs that are in that area she could get to. You can also look at access to education, shopping, or whatever. But what I want you to, to, to retain from this image is the image of there being a kind of wall around your life beyond which you really can't go to make a certain kind of trip. Now, actually, of course, what there is is a series of concentric walls associated with different amounts of travel time, because if, if there's a limit to how much time we can spend on a trip we're going to take make almost every day, like a commute, there's a somewhat larger limit on a trip we're going to make more rarely, like once a week. But for any kind of trip, there's an amount of time that's reasonable beyond which we're probably just not going to make the trip if we can if we can uh, if we have an alternative. We're probably just not going to hold that job or go to that church or whatever. Now, of course, when you think about the blob this way, it's clear right away how transportation and land use development interact. Transportation is about expanding the blob and development is about putting more useful stuff inside the existing blob. Um, and both of those things expand or reduce freedom. You expand or reduce freedom by making the blog bigger or smaller, which is what transportation does. You also expand or reduce freedom by making the area already inside the blob more or less useful by adding or subtracting useful destinations. Now, when I talk to you about a 45 minute travel time too, when I'm talking about public transit, it's important to be clear that I mean the sum of the three parts of a transit trip, the walk, the wait, and the ride. So we can often improve one of these a lot by sacrificing a bit of another, improving total freedom. When we do redesigns of bus networks, um, very frequently what you'll see happening is that we will be asking people to walk a little further in order to wait less. For example, by moving bus stops a little further apart so that service can operate faster and therefore can operate more frequently. Or um, asking, proposing that parallel routes be a little further apart, walk a little further, but then get to a service that runs more frequently, which is possible because there are fewer of them. Those are the kinds of calculations that play out inside of network planning all the time. Now to visualize this a little more, here's an example from, from a study we did in Dublin, Ireland. We worked on the redesign of the Dublin, Ireland bus network a few years ago. And so again, you visualize someone at a, at a hypothetical place. This happens to be Dundrum, which is, a, which is a suburban area, but it could be anywhere. And she's asking, where can I go in 45 minutes? And I want to, and again, this is the same question as where could I work? Where could I study? Where could I shop? Where could I worship? Who could I visit? Who could I meet? Which is to say, how free am I? Now, you may not think of 45 minutes as your limit for each of these things, but you have a limit you have a limit beyond which it would just not be practical to go to this place to do this thing. And whatever that limit is, that's what we're working on. That's what we're talking about as being the wall around your life. So there's an existing network. There's an area she can get to in 45 minutes in the existing network. There's a somewhat larger area she can get to in the proposed network. And I can calculate the difference. I can show the area gained and the area lost as a result of the network change. And I can say that, it, that at the bottom, that adds up to 25% more jobs uh, that, she, that she can get to in 45 minutes. And when you look also at across all the other destination types, whether it's shopping or social or everything else, I would end up saying that she's about 25% freer in terms of the opportunities that are available to her using public transit. Here's an example of what that meant in terms of the design of the network. And what I want you to notice here is that we had inherited a network that was extremely complicated, piles and piles of confusingly overlapping routes, and that wasn't very frequent. The red lines on this map means buses that are always coming soon, and most of them weren't. The proposed network has fewer routes but they are all running much more frequently, which means, for example, that everywhere that route that frequent routes cross, it's easy to make a connection to go more places. And that's how the network expands the blob of access so well. It does it not by focusing just on how far you have to walk or how long you have to wait it or, how, or how fast your ride is going to be. It focuses instead on the sum of those three things and tries to minimize that. And generally, the way the math works, 
we end up doing that by running fewer services more frequently, um, asking people to walk a little further, to wait quite a bit less. And also that means, for example, that buses tend to stay on bigger, faster streets where they aren't going, where, where they're going to be able to operate with less delay. We can show the same thing on a, re a region-wide level. So I can color each uh, zone of the city according to how much access to opportunity expanded or contracted at that location as a result of the plan. And someone who knew Dublin would look at this map and say, okay, yes, I see that the brown places where it got worse are places where there aren't very many people, and the green places where it got better are places where there are lots of people. So it makes sense. So they are not, we're not surprised to hear that on average across the population, we expanded freedom a lot, 16% more destinations in 45 minutes. And that's so my so my point is transportation planning is freedom planning. And I encourage you to be aware that when trans that as you're reading transportation plans and as you're debating transportation plans, that they are going to affect where people can go in an amount of time that they have, which is going to affect their freedom. What is freedom really, but the presence of choices of, uh, before us about what we could do? Now, the thing is that lots of other things affect these blobs too. As I said before, land use planning is also freedom planning because it decides whether things will be nearby or far away. Ask me some time about how social security offices are located in the United States. It drives me crazy. Um, many, many things are not located, are, are located far away, therefore reducing our freedom. Um, development approval, street design operations, pricing, traffic operations, transit operations, decisions in all these areas expand or reduce our freedom. And we ought to be talking about freedom, in my view, as we're talking about those things. Now in public transit, when we're talking about transit planning, a network that expands freedom is going to expand ridership. And the reason for that is if you stop and think about what we're doing, in a network designed for high access, it means that a per any person who looks up any trip that they're thinking about making is more likely to find that the travel time is reasonable. And that is the whole point. Without that, you're simply not going to have ridership. With that, you are. And so that's and so the great thing about access oriented planning or thinking about access or freedom as we do planning is that we are capturing both um, is is that we are we are not just talking about the essence of what generates ridership. We're also at the same time talking about something that needs no justification, which is that it's great for people to have more freedom. It's great for people to have more choices and opportunities in their lives. Um, Finally, it's important to recognize that freedom is a geometric fact, and that makes it very different from a lot of the other facts that are running out around out there in transportation planning. We think about a project, whether it's a network design or some kind of land use development, and it's going to generate a freedom outcome. The transportation project is going to change the size of the blobs. The land use project is going to change um, who, how many people are benefiting from already being in the blobs or what destinations are already in the blobs. Either way, that's affecting freedom measurably. But that relationship is one of geometry. If we have the development, if, if we have the geographic layout of the city and the geographic layout of the transit network, um, we can calculate the freedom that results really with very little reference to the human sciences. It's really mostly a geometry calculation. There are a couple of exceptions. But in the big picture, that means it's a calculation we're very sure of. However, in most transportation planning, we then go on another step and say, based on how freedom has changed, how will this affect customers, traffic, ridership, all kinds of outcomes that investors and decision makers care about? You have to remember, that's the social sciences. Those are predictions of human behavior. That is much less certain and much more transitory much more likely to change over time in response to various kinds of cultural changes in terms of how people behave in the network. But the sheer possibility that we presented people with, the freedom, that's something quite durable. That's something that's not going to change. It's something we can understand very solidly because it's really just geometry. And this is important when you think about 
how how much you want to believe predictions and how much you want to rely on predictions of things like ridership or traffic in your transportation planning. Our, our infrastructure planning um, system is built on the assumption that we can predict the future. But in, my, in the course of my lifetime, certainly the 30 years I've been in this business, the world has just become progressively less and less predictable. And we, it has become more and more the daily reality that we need to think about how a network and a community will continue through unpredictable nonlinear shocks like pandemics, for example. And that as a result, um, prediction is something we should have a lot of humility about and that if we can depend less on prediction, we can be on more solid ground. After all, we don't really want to be predicted as humans. If you think about if you think about the idea of building a 20 or 30 year plan first and foremost on a foundation of predictions about how people will behave in 30 years well those predictions are about, are based on how people behave today and that's exactly like telling your um, telling your your children that when you're the same that when they're the same age that you are now they'll behave exactly the way you do that's not really something you should we should be counting on. That's not something we should be assuming about the next generation, that they will respond in the same way that we do, in the way that, that we might predict based on how we behave. But that's what's happening. When you make predictions of human behavior 30 years from now, you're, you're predicting your children's behavior based on how you behave now. It's worth stopping and thinking about whether that's actually a good thing to believe. So, Finally, when we're expanding freedom and when we're thinking about freedom, it'll bring us sometimes into conflict with a lot of strong emotions that show up in trans transportation debates. Our emotions about infrastructure, things like this will bring prestige or other people have this, why don't we? Or I want to cut a ribbon from, the, from, the, uh, from sometimes from the elected efficient, officials perspective. Those can be reasons to create a piece of transit infrastructure that doesn't actually optimize freedom because it's doing something else like symbolizing or representing. Um, likewise, we have to confront our emotions about technology. We're constantly being bombarded with messages that um, all kinds of wonderful new technologies are happening in transportation, often with the implication that any old, old technologies are by definition obsolete, which is of course ridiculous. Most innovations fail. Many old technologies are still absolutely essential. Um, we have to constantly um, uh, bring some skepticism to that constant pressure to rush after whatever is new, because that also can be a reason to roll out things that do not really do much for our freedom or maybe even reduce it. Bottom line is that only if we are measuring our freedom will we know if we're achieving. So, um, I'm really keen to welcome your questions and discussion. Thank you. Oh, I am muted. Jared, thank you for a great presentation. Um, and I'm hoping that's going to spark a, a great conversation by our guests. Um, I'm going to kick us off with uh, with one question. I have multiple, I have a bunch of other questions, but I'm encouraging our audience to type them in the chat, um, or at, if you'd like to come off mute, uh, we might be able to facilitate that too, depending. All right. So first question is uh, your framing of in increasing where people, one can go within 45 minutes or the number of jobs they can get to within 45 minutes as one of freedom really rings true for me. Um, and it marries a lot with uh, a study published now, I think seven years ago uh, by Harvard researchers about uh, how transportation is the number one factor for socioeconomic mobility over generations. And I'm curious what your thoughts are on the importance of a really good transit network for 
expanding socioeconomic mobility and addressing issues like racial justice and and other issues like that. I think that's really just fundamental. Um, the one thing I want to say about that is that, um, yes, it's a crucial tool for enhancing mobility, for, for enhancing um, um, the, however, um, however you want to try it, it is a crucial tool for bringing people into connection with opportunity. And one of the things we often do with the freedom analysis tool is look particularly at how we have affected the freedom of people of color, of low income people, people living with various kinds of disadvantage, and we can use this tool and apply it just to them. You know, what's the level of, uh, you know, how have we changed the freedom and opportunity that these particular disadvantaged groups are experiencing? One thing I want to mention about that, though, is that as you drill into this, it becomes clear that transit cannot heal by itself the injustices created by land use planning, Inju inju injustices created by historic the historic evolution of land use that is in some cases caused relatively disadvantaged people to have to live in really difficult places where it's very diff where um, where they are, for example, a long way from the things that they need and where they are potentially also a long uh, um, and, and very often also ending up in new in more recent suburban geographies that are just really hard for public transit to serve because of the way they're built the high speed streets that, that aren't safe to cross, all those kinds of things. So it's important too that public transit not, that we not start, start just looking to public transit agencies to fix those things without recognizing the larger context of, of how that problem got created and all the dimensions of that problem. Yeah, that's really good. Um, I'm wondering, uh, Tina Ray, if you might be willing to ask your question out loud, so I'm going to see if you can. Tina, are you there and are you available to ask your question or plural questions? Well, while we figure this out, the audience figures out how to do that, I'll ask uh, a couple that she asked in the uh, Q&A. How do you measure the transportation uh, freedom specifically uh, within and the success of it? Um, and her second question is, how do you measure transportation planning success specifically within underserved communities? Right. So the way we'll talk about this typically is I'll look at a particular um, community that is full of people ex um, experiencing historic disadvantage or current disadvantage, low-income communities, um, predominantly people of color communities or whatever, and I'll look at where they can get to from where they are in, in a fixed amount of time. And then I'll look at how a proposed plan changes that. And to, you can, of course, satisfy basic civil rights requirements just by saying that you haven't made it worse. Uh, unfortunately, most of our federal civil rights um, uh, analysis methods under Title VI are mostly about not making it worse. They're not really about making it better or, or healing what is wrong with what we have. But you certainly can then show that you have achieved on balance in a plan a higher benefit for people of color, for people living with lower incomes than for the general population. And that's one good way to indicate that there is a lean in the direction of equity, a lean in the direction of, of a restorative focus on those people. That's very different from those people necessarily all finding that the network has met their needs. Um, again, you can have such horrific land use and development patterns that you know some disadvantaged people end up living in places where it's just very hard for any kind of efficient public transit to get to them. And that will show in that possibly we've made an improvement, but that's certainly not the same as everything being good for them. We don't, we don't claim that everything is good for them. There are so many other elements to elements to that. Uh, that yeah, I think that goes into a comment uh, provided by Michelle Zeidman in the Q&A. And I, I'll just read Michelle's uh, comment and then uh, maybe pose a question. Um, 
she says, I appreciate the concept that freedom is a geometric fact, but it seems to assume that all people are willing or able to walk or roll a certain distance. Uh, but that is not true. People with some disabilities, older adults and parents pushing strollers may not be able to walk, roll as far as others. I wonder what you might suggest for planners trying to optimize access for all. So question there. And I think this also gets to the point of, um, you know, there's, uh, this is simplifying a little bit, but uh, as transit planners or network planners, there's a tension between a coverage-based approach or where you make sure that there's a bus stop nearest to every major uh, potential rider possible, especially those uh, with particular needs. Um, and then making sure that you're make sure that most people can use the system. Uh, and so prioritizing more of a, a frequency, uh, speed, reliability network that ends up being a little bit more grid-like and fewer, fewer bus stops, uh, but potentially serving people, the general public better. Um, so there's a tension there and certainly one that Snowtrack is very concerned about because we have certain priority populations that we're trying to fill mobility gaps for. And so looking at paratransit, at nonprofit transportation providers, at non-emergency medical transportation providers to fill those gaps. Um, so uh, what's, uh, expound a little bit on the tensions and uh, her and Michelle's uh, question about how, or what suggestions you have for optimizing access for all. I think we have to be very clear and honest with ourselves uh, and, and about where we have win-win solutions and where we have genuine conflicts between competing goals that are just never going to be able to be harmonized in a way that's completely satisfactory to everyone. Um, serving low-income people, serving people of color um, is not something that is in conflict with a goal of maximizing ridership overall. Those things are in con uh, low income people are a great market. Transit agencies should be pursuing them because they are a great uh, because they are a great ridership market that's worth competing for. You don't need equity. You don't need to be thinking about them in a category of disadvantage in order to justify serving them. It's smart to serve them anyway if the goal is ridership. There is a genuine and very difficult conflict between the needs of some people who have particular who have particular cause them to respond to particular parts of the trip in a certain way. And, the, and the, the big example is the one you mentioned, people who have a greater resistance to walking or rolling because of their physical abilities. Um, we, if we design the public transit system for everyone around what is a good walking distance for them, we end up with a public transit system that's just not very useful to anyone else. And that's the challenge. And so because, um, and, and, and you know, let's just take the very simplest example, which is, which is stop spacing going along a route. Um, the United States has historically put bus stops very close together. Uh, in Europe, the typ typically consecutive bus stops on a route are 50 to 100% further apart than on average they are in the US. The bus stops, if you've ever ridden the rapid ride services inside of Seattle, which stop about every quarter mile, that is the kind of stop spacing you expect in Europe, almost never less than a quarter mile. Now that's because the European tr transit networks have been optimized for a long time to provide an, a maximum access for an average, you know, you know, for a sort of dominant 80% of the population that is more or less able-bodied and who will have no problem walking another block in order to get on a bus that goes much faster because it stops so much less. So we have to work through that in this country but I think we have to, and I think the answer is a mixture of several things. It is recognizing that there's enormous work to be done on the street environment because there are places where the problem with the walk is not the, the sheer distance, but some nature of the experience, whether it's the accessibility of the sidewalk, the lighting, whatever else, all these other things that create part of that experience. Um, 
we have to then look carefully at making sure we understand how many people really do end up in a situation where they are cut off from service if we don't serve them. We can't just look at age, for example, because people are remaining healthier later in life. And there are more and more every year, there are not just more 80 year olds, but there are more 80 year olds who have no problem walking a quarter mile, right? And so we can't just use A. Um, and then finally, when we get down to who are those people who are really, really um, not going to have an alternative, we have to find an alternative for them. And that may sometimes end up including paratransit or the kinds of services that your agency, um, uh, that, that your organization develops. But the only alternative, if we, if, we, if we simply say, well, we can't move stop, we have to keep the stops very close together because there are some people at every stop who can't walk, we'll end up perpetuating a quality of public transit service that most people just won't find useful. And we're going to pay for that in other ways, in low ridership, in, in the climate and congestion outcomes associated with people using cars instead of transit. So it's not easy. And it's very important that we be able to, talk, to, to look at the geometry clearly and understand why there are places where we're not going to avoid this trade-off. And we have to then have a humane and inclusive conversation about how to not abandon that one person, but also not abandon the other 90% who would respond much more effectively to a service that runs faster with fewer stops. It's hard. Um, I'll take a point of personal privilege and asking kind of a follow-up question here, which is um, it, at the end of your presentation, you provide some skepticism of uh, new technologies and not uh, just going after any new shiny object that's coming down the road. And I think two years ago, I definitely had some personal uh, skepticism of microtransit and app-based uh, services of providing last mile coverage uh, on a cost per rider basis of whether that would be justifiable. Numbers I've seen over the last year or so, at least from within state, I've uh, been persuaded that certain situations it might work. Um, and uh, here in the county, community transit is a pilot project uh, that's ongoing is now nine or so months uh, into its pilot and then three more projects of innovative transportation services to be rolled out uh, over the next 12 or so months. I'm curious what your thoughts are um, and whether that is one of those types of services that might fill that gap um, of where, yes, we have paratransit service, but uh, certainly that doesn't provide the same uh, real-time demand service that actually gives people freedom um, that they have to schedule a day or two in advance. So I'm curious what your thoughts are on microtransit. Yeah, um, and I'm sorry if I offend anyone at, at um, community transit or anyone else, I really wish you wouldn't call these innovative services. It's um, dial a ride has existed for decades. I was designing demand responsive transit systems 30 years ago. Back then, before we had the internet, the way it worked was that you had to request your trip a day in advance. You called up on the phone, you asked someone, and uh, somebody took your order and then hooked the trips together and all that happened. So the apps have accelerated and taken a lot of friction out of a kind of service that already existed. And um, I think that the more you tell yourself that it's innovative, the more you tell yourself that it's, it's new and dazzling and different, the more you're going to take your eye off the fundamental geometry of what's happening. What's still happening is that a vehicle with a paid driver is going to a particular place to pick up that person and going to another place to pick up that person and going to another place to pick up that person. If you're lucky, if there's enough demand for their ridership, then you're going, then the vehicle is going to make a meandering path through its area because the people who are asking for it are not in a straight line. And there are development patterns where the street network is so disconnected that that's the least bad way of doing it. And we frequently do recommend those services when, A, we're in a development pattern that is uh, not conducive to fixed transit service, and very importantly, B, 
our client agency is very clear that this is not a ridership maximizing strategy. This is a coverage strategy. We are not, it, it, the ridership maximizing strategy for the agency would be to not to serve this place at all because it's so in, inhospitable to efficient public transit. So the if you're going to serve this for a coverage reason, which is absolutely fine, absolutely fine, just document clearly that's what you're doing. If you're gonna serve this area for a coverage reason, Demand responsive transit can be a more efficient way of doing that than a fixed route in certain kinds of very hostile geography. Um, and, and, and so we recommend we do recommend them. We have we we you know we do um, many network design studies every year and we often do recommend them. I have nothing against demand responsive transit. It's definitely part of the um, it's definitely part of the um, toolbox. Um, I don't think we have been well served by telling ourselves that it's something new and special and fancy that solves all our problems. It's a it's a very old idea that's been improved a little bit in, in its efficiency, but you can't change the fact that going to different places to pick people up is going to be less efficient than asking people to walk out to a straight line that you can operate, which allows your bus to operate in a straight line, which is much more likely to be what the people on that bus want to do. That's the trade-off. Um, I'm going to uh, read Sasha, uh, Sasha's question, and then I'm going to tip off Barb to ask, uh, see if uh, she can come on screen or at least uh, ask it verbally herself. So I'm going to see how that goes. So Sasha asks a question from your book um, about how you mentioned stop spacing and duplicate service or duplicate coverage uh, from having stops too close together. Um, mm -hmm. And she asks, are there methods you use to measure, assess different stop spacing alternatives? Um, and I would add to the follow-up, because I'm just curious about it. In Snohomish County, um, we generally don't put local uh, transit stops where our BRT stops are. They're uh, a, usually across the intersection or just separated from one another. And I'm curious what your thoughts are uh, about uh, that design. I think to take the last one first, there may be some technical or physical reason, but that is probably not the act, the freedom maximizing way to do it. The freedom maximizing way to do it is to minimize the friction, but in involved in the connection between a local bus and a BRT bus by making their stops as adjacent as possible. And I can, I'm sure there are reasons why you don't want a local bus to just stop in the BRT stop and, and block the BRT bus. But, um, but I definitely would agree that, that you know, I think you'd find a freedom analysis that would say that those, those should be as frictionless as possible. It's already a nuisance to connect, but the logic of efficient networks requires that we ask people to make connections. It's incumbent on us as transit planners and in the design of infrastructure to be trying to make those connections as easy as possible. Absolutely. The bigger question about how we assess stop spacing, we will do, um, uh, we will do, a, we will generally show, oh, at least the one most important thing about stop spacing is that if you've got a particular route or corridor, you have to have a stop spacing conversation about the entire corridor. You can't have a conversation about just one or two stops. You have to have a conversation about over a long distance, ideally over the whole, or, or over an entire network to show what the benefits are of rationalizing the stop spacing. Um, if you, um, um, and because then one of the things you're doing, which is appealing to a lot of people, or under, what people understand, is you're making stop spacing consistent. Like many other things about transit agencies that evolved in the era when everything was done based on who came to a public meeting and yelled at you, there are all sorts of weird things in stops going on in stop spacing that are the result of things that somebody asked for 20 years ago. And you have to go and, and you know, when the time comes, you have to really go through and say, no, we're going to place stops according to a consistent policy with a consistent maximum walking distance with these exceptions. Obviously, you know, there's a senior center, we'll put a stop in front of the senior center, but with the goal of having the fewest possible number of stops that serves the entire community. And um and we'll do a kind of analysis that includes sort of exactly who is in a catchment of a particular distance from a stop. It depends enormously, for example, on the quality of the local street network, how connected it is. Depends on how hard it is to cross the street. Here's one other interesting to think about. Snohomish County, 
you know, in the urban parts of Snohomish County, you have a lot of those big arterials that are not really safe to cross without a crosswalk. One of the things to ask is, should that reality be governing your stop spacing? What does it mean to put two stops on opposite sides of the street that is not safe to cross at that location? And um, and this is and this is very tricky. My my own view is that where we will have to end up with on the classic suburban boulevard, the Highway 99 kind of street, is relatively wide stop spacing with crosswalks at the stops. So because realistically, the way those suburban boulevards have been conceived, the Aurora avenues of the world, unless you are going to completely rip them all out and drastically reduce their capacity and turn them into something very different, you're not going to be able to provide safe crossings very frequently anyway. And so you'll probably end up with a relatively wide stop spacing that has to be aligned with safe pedestrian crossings. So I go out, you know, if you just want a, a, a slogan, the slogan would be a safe place to cross the street every quarter mile and put the bus stop there. That can kind of override all the other calculations when it comes down to it. All right, we'll try to see if we can get uh, Barb Chamberlain to ask her question live. Thanks, Brock. I'm not going to go on camera. I made this a walking meeting. Um, I want to thank Jarrett because when I was a volunteer advocate, I learned so much from your blog. So uh, mm -hmm. you're training transportation professionals all the time. My question was, you, you're talking about transportation freedom. I, I talk about transportation independence. And as we have this aging society, I plan to be an 80 year old walking to the stop, but some people are going to age out of that kind of thing. And I don't think people think about the system for their future selves. So I'm just wondering how agencies can foster that more long-term thinking about people saying, oh, I don't need it today, but I want it there in the future. I think that's really, um, I think that's really challenging because the other part of this that we can't, um, I, mean, I mean, the other part is when you think about how, how about long-term planning and public transit, one of the things I want to is for long-term public transit plans and for the evolution of the public transit network to send people clear signals about where will be a good place to live if you want to be an 80-year-old continuing to rely on public transit when walking starts to become difficult for you. You can't necessarily expect that on the big house on a quarter acre lot where you raised your family. It may that that it, that just may not be reasonable there because the density is not going to be enough to necessarily support public transit in a distance you can walk to. And that's if you if you make that choice to stay in the house you raised your family in, then you're probably going to be reliant on paratransit or something like that. Um, but I think that we have to be clear that especially when we're talking 20 years in the future, 10, 20 years in the future, we're not talking necessarily about people's current locations. We're talking about how do we give people clear signals and how do we give developers clear signals about where is where is going to be a good place to be if you want to be an 80-year-old who can still use transit. And this goes to the whole issue about how, you know, you know, how senior facilities are being cited, how various other kinds of destinations are being cited. You know, when I senior, see a senior housing facility at the end of a hilltop cul-de-sac that comes off of a six of a six lane, 50 mile an hour road without a signal, I know that no one in that facility is going to use fixed route service. You know, they might eventually be able to go to enough public meetings to, you know, convince the transit agency to run some service up to them, except that they'd have to probably rebuild their parking lot so that a bus could go up there and turn around. And the service would never, and, and even if they got the transit agency to do that, the service probably would never be all that guaranteed because it would have really low ridership and everyone else on the bus who was riding through that deviation would be mad about, about it. And it would just never really be a kind of satisfactory solution. The solution is to think about this when you locate at all the different stages, life decisions, when we make decisions about where to locate, to think about this then. To have, and that means the transit agency having really clear maps out and really clear information out and the real estate industry having really clear information out. Um, very, very poor. I mean, I think I think 
I, I can't, I, I don't know the situation in Snohomish County generally, but generally in the United States, I think there's a big gap in how um, realtors, apartment agents, everyone else who helps people make location choices, how those people learn about the transit system and how they come to understand what's, uh, um, you know, what they can expect of transit from a particular location. A huge, huge issue, huge low hanging fruit. Um, I think I'm going to see if, uh, yes, Rob, uh, I'm pretty sure you know Jarrett quite well. Um, would you be willing to ask your question live? Yes. Can you hear me? Yes. I can hear you, Rob. Hey, Jarrett. Great hey, to hear you. Um, hope you're doing well. Uh, I have a general question about uh, transit agencies becoming mobility management agencies. Uh, we're hearing a lot of uh, excitement and talk about that. Uh, you made some comments about old technology and new technology. Uh, what is your general uh, reaction to a move towards uh, transit agencies providing a variety of uh, services, not just fixed route and integrating technology to provide different services to people need to travel? Thank you. Uh, I don't think there's anything necessarily wrong with it, but there's a there's a thing to be cautious about there. Um, one of the reasons that transit agencies are being pressured to do this and encouraged to do this is because a certain share of the elite opinion that they are responding to doesn't understand fixed route service and doesn't value fixed route service very much and wants them to do other things that will be of higher status or higher prestige. Transit agencies have to be clear about why 95% of their budget is fixed route service. It's because fixed route service is a spectacularly efficient tool and nobody's gonna do it if they don't. Um, so as transit agencies um, expand on, choose to, if ch transit agencies choose to expand on their mission, that's fine as long as there is clarity about why fixed route service is still the foundation of it. If on the other hand, they're expanding their mission because they just need to be liked and they're not getting enough love for running fixed route service, that, that's, that's not necessarily the best reason. <laughs> um, there needs, there, fixed route service really needs to be advocated for and you know, people really need to, you know, the work needs to be done to help people understand, to help very poor, fortunate people who would never use fixed route service understand um, why fixed route service is doing such incredible good for the community or why it's so important and why nobody else will do it if the transit agency doesn't. Thank you for that. It's economies of scale with fixed route service, uh, which is what I'm expecting. Thank you very much. Yeah. I'm going to take one last question. I'm hoping Laura Lowe is willing to come off mute to ask her question. Hello, everybody. Laura Lowe. I'm uh, at Hopelink, and I'm the Find a Ride uh, One Call One Click System Program Manager. And I'm asking about uh, rural transit planning. Um, before my job that I have now, it wasn't something I thought about as I live in Seattle near a rapid ride line. But over the last, you know, five months or so, I really dove into that topic, and it seems like there's some very unique considerations for rural transit planning um, that that I hadn't been you know, you known about before now. I was curious what your thoughts are. You've already shared some, but if you could expand more on rural transit. Rural transit's fascinating. Now, the overwhelming argument for transit in cities, which is that it's about the efficient use of space where space is scarce and sp space is scarce in cities. That argument doesn't apply to rural areas. Rural areas are defined by the abundance of space. Um, what you have in rural areas, though, are um, a lot of severe needs, and yet the, ne the, the need to meet those needs extremely efficiently because the costs of, are so high at covering these distances. I am, uh, I think that there's a layer of rural need that is similar to what we expect of paratransit. The person who lives the 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 um, person living with a disability who needs to get to a particular medical facility at a particular time. 
the growth market in rural transit, I think, is links between towns and hooking together towns over distances so that people can get into their county service center that has the, the largest grocery store and that has the, the courthouse and that has the other uh, other things that are going to be only there. Um, the the and, and that really um, is an area where um, where there's going to be more and more need. I think we we have rural people have a lot more options for getting around inside of a town. You can even walk if you need to, than they have for getting across the 20 miles to the next town. And so I think that the bridging of that distance, the covering the covering the distance, having a nice stop in the town, not driving all over the town if you can avoid it. Although you certainly have to go over here to hit the Walmart or whatever. Um, I think that I think those are those are kind of cap that kind of captures what seems to be the most effective rural transit. Now, in many cases, this is what Greyhound used to do, right? Um, Greyhound used to be the rural provider across and, and trailways and so on. When I was young, it was the rural provider across so much of the country, was stopping in all these old towns, you know, going through three or four times a day, and but they'd stop once in the town and then you'd walk from there or, or you know make other arrangements from there. So I think rural transit is fascinating and very difficult and and very much worth a lot of attention. And it really is that whole spectrum from the kind of paratransit trip on the one hand to what I think is the highest ridership thing you can do in rural, which is linking the towns together over distance. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Laura. We're going to wrap up our Q&A there. Uh, thank you again, Jerry, for this important presentation and conversation. Um, we're going to wrap up. Uh, Snowtrack has some exciting events as well as Transportation Choices Coalition. And so we hope to see you uh, at them. Um, you can learn more about them at gosnotrack.org slash events, as well as at transportationchoices.org. Um, it is Ride Transit Month. So um, you can take Transportation Choices uh, Pledge to Ride, and you can share it with your networks. Um, they have featured events, including next Wednesday, Transit Trivia Night. Uh, on June 21st, there's a transit talk um, at right before our own uh, snow track speaker. And then there's Ride Transit Night at the ballpark, the Mariners, at the end of the month. They also, you can buy a, a t-shirt and uh, do transit bingo. And our next speaker is Nathan Voss um, on June 21st at noon. He is the author of The Lines That Make Us. He is a Metro bus driver and takes a wonderful empathetic approach towards uh, life as, and bus driving. So I hope you encourage all your bus drivers to show up and learn uh, how they can serve their entire community. With that, uh, Jarrett, thank you again. Um, thank you and so thank much. you, audience.